All right, back to First uh, First Kings, Second uh, King, Second King six. There's some uh, sobering passages regarding uh, angels and angelology. We looked at uh, Daniel chapter 10, and we saw how that prayer uh, and answers to prayer uh, are a part of spiritual warfare, which is why the devil hinders us probably in our prayer life more than any other thing. Uh, even if we get to the place, a person gets to the place where they set aside time for it, that doesn't mean that uh, they've won the battle. The devil is going gonna, is gonna to work on a person's mind and their spirit during that time. Uh, and he knows, I think probably one of the most effective tools of the devil is distraction. Uh, he, today in society, it's the distracted society, isn't it? Uh, it's a uh, uh, society that's uh, doing something and thinking about something else. Or not able to concentrate for a long period of time on one subject, uh, on one topic, and the Bible uh, calls that meditation, right? It talks about meditating on God's Word and the great benefits that come from meditation. Uh, and so, of course, the devil is going to work to distract and to uh, sidetrack us in our meditation of God's Word and in our prayer. And so Daniel 10 is an example of spiritual warfare that takes place during, during a time of prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, we looked at the, uh, who we wrestle with, uh, followed by the Christian armor. Now here's 2 Kings chapter 6, and uh, this is a third passage that illustrates the, what I call the fine line between the, uh, what is seen and what is unseen. There's a very fine line, and this, uh, this situation illustrates it as well. There's a, a great uh, horde uh, comes against um, uh, here against uh, Israel. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, verse 13, Go spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and uh, compassed the city about. And uh, here is Elisha and a young servant, young man, together. And 15, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant, Elisha's servant, said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? All right, so this, this, is the, uh, this is the chapter of young men getting into the position of uh, uh, the alas statements, right? Verse 5, we looked at that uh, earlier on. A man lost a, a borrowed uh, axe head, and uh, he's in despair. Uh, well, that's one thing, but now this entire host is encircling them. Verse 15, alas, my master, how shall we do? And uh, then, uh, <clears throat> so this young man uh, was not a veteran of spiritual war warfare like Elisha was. And it's interesting the difference in the response of Elisha from the young man. So the young man says, alas, in verse 16, Elisha says, fear not. And uh, he says in the following statement because of his understanding of angelology because of the understanding of spiritual warfare and because of his quiet confidence that he gained through his time and his walk with God. So in verse uh, 15 we have a great statement that says, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And uh, that was not in the, in the physical sense or seen with the human eyes. And then Elisha turns and prays uh, to the Lord with whom uh, apparently he had a very close uh, relationship. Verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And uh, open his eyes. What, what eyes? <laughs> the, the, the young man's eyes were open. But there's a prayer that uh, this man of God prayed for this young man is that his eyes would be opened. Um, and, and these eyes are... are eyes that are able to see and understand and believe in the spiritual world, 
that was there, but just not there to his physical eyes. And so in this prayer, the Lord answers it in that verse, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, uh, Elisha had seen firsthand a chariot of fire, hadn't he? Not too long before. Uh, he was there when Elijah was taken up to heaven in one. So he'd seen this before. Uh, this young man hadn't. And, and you can't blame the young man, I guess, uh, here in a sense. Um, but it was a great opportunity for him to see, have the veil taken away for, if nothing else, for a moment about something that Elisha saw. Now, I don't know that Elisha walked around seeing the chariots of fire all the time, but he had seen it and knew it was true and uh, knew that uh, the Lord um, was not going to leave him unprotected even in the face of this great host. Um, Psalm 119, 18. Let's look there real quick. Psalm 119, 18. The fine line between uh, what is seen and what is unseen. While we might not pray today to have our eyes open so we can visibly see the Lord's host of angels, Here's a prayer that each of us can make and that will serve the same purpose. Okay, Psalm 119.18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, um, what does open mine eyes here mean? Well, the, obviously it doesn't mean to see things physically. But open mine eyes, or uh, unveil my eyes, that I may uh, behold. And the word behold there is a little uh, more deep than just the word see. The word behold there has to the idea of to discern, or to see really clear, or to see within God's perspective, to see from God's vantage point. So from God's vantage point, this city of Dothan, surrounded by a host, with his man of God and the young servant inside the city was not a problematic situation because the Lord saw this huge host in the sky uh, uh, before he saw the host of uh, human uh, armies around Dothan and he saw his host followed by the problems on the earth surrounding a man who believed in him. And that's the same, the, way, the same way that the Lord sees you as His child today. So we look out and we see the problems surrounding us. Well, God looks down on us. Well, number one, He is God and we learn about Him in, in here as well. But then He looks and sees His host. And then I think He looks down to see if there's a faith on the part of his child on earth that feels surrounded, if he sees faith on their part, realize that God is going to be there and going to take care of them and is available to help. So when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? It's a great question for us to ask ourselves. Will he find faith in us? Will he find us so fretting over the host that surrounds us uh, that we don't have spiritual sight to... Uh, to see uh, the realities of uh, what the Lord has provided for us. There's a fine line uh, between uh, what we see and what is uh, happening. And this young man uh, got, a, got a view of that one day. All right, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to move uh, here along today, uh, some other sections I'd like to spend a little more time on. So Roman numeral number three with regard to angelology is the number of angels, uh, the number. And uh, <clears throat> several passages give us an idea of this, but the number very simply is innumerable. 
So, so they've, they've never been put to a number, innumerable. Um, um, you can write these verses down. Daniel 7.10. Matthew 26.53. Let's look at Matthew 26. Uh, by the way, we're talking about uh, an angelic activity heightened during the time of Christ. Let's look at Matthew 26, 53. Uh, look at verse 51 just for the context here. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place. For all that are take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently, instantly, give me more, give me more than twelve legions of angels. All right. So uh, legions. Um, 6,000, a legion consisted of 6,000. So 6,000 times 12 is 72,000 angels that that quick instantly could have been sent to the help of uh, the Lord at this, at this very moment. Uh, and these legions of angels uh, would form a host. In other words, an army here. Um, and we get that from the context what we'll talk about here in verse 52. Uh, and we see that the angelic host formed an army in 2 Kings chapter 6 as well. So here at the very moment, the Lord could have called um, uh, 12 legions of angels. And uh, somebody wrote a song about this, right? He could have called 10,000 angels, right? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting, amazing thought. Here, 12 legions of angels are mentioned. So that's, uh, that's 62,000 more. So he could have called 12 legions of angels. It doesn't sound as good. Um, so that's probably why I didn't make it into that song. Uh, all right, anyway, so it's innumerable. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, and here's our word, innumerable company of angels, innumerable there, or a myriad, or myriads of angels. So uh, the angelic host here is uh, listed as innumerable. Revelation 5.11 indicates this as well. All right, so we looked at the existence, the origin, the number, and now Roman numeral number four, the nature, the nature of angels. We'll look at some things that they are not and some things that they are with regard to the nature. So letter A, they are not glorified human beings, contrary to what <clears throat> some starstruck guys like to call their significant other. Sorry, there are no uh, human beings. Angels are not glorified human beings. Let's look at Matthew 22.30 for that. Matthew 22.30. Matthew 22.30. Foreign resurrection. Um, <clears throat> this... Uh, um, talking about the question they threw at Jesus regarding uh, uh, a woman who um, had uh, legitimately se uh, several um, husbands here. Um, verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so um, we will not become angels when we die. Number one, we will not become angels when we die. Okay, you don't die and become an angel. <laughs> uh, 
Number two, uh, we will judge the angels. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.3. 1 Corinthians 6.3. We will judge the angels. Verse 2, do not uh, ye know that the saints shall judge the world? For if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So this is telling churches that uh, take care of the problems within your own membership. Um, take care of the problems within your own membership. And then number three, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more are the things that pertain to this life? So in the midst of this, a situation dealing with church issues, Paul says, we're going to judge angels. So we get a little angelology in the middle of these, uh, this uh, discussion on how to handle problems within a church. So angels, uh, their nature, A, they're not glorified human beings. We're not going to become angels when we die. We will judge angels. Letter B, under their nature, they are spiritual beings. They are spiritual beings. Let's look at Hebrews 1.13. Hebrews 1.13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? And so he did not say that to angels. Um, so in verse 14, we have a description, though, of what an angel is or does. Are they not, these angels, are they not ministering spirits um, <clears throat> sent forth? to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So the angels, these ministering spirits, are sent forth to uh, minister, or uh, the idea of minister here is our word for serve or service. Our word for deacon comes from this too. Are they not sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Um, so those about to inherit salvation have these uh, ministering spirits sent forth to them all right so there's uh, uh, the idea that these angels are spirits underneath this number one they're made of nothing from this world in, 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 in this sense they're not of flesh and bones they do not have flesh and bones No flesh and bones. Uh, let's look at Psalm 104, verse 4. So, no, these angels are spiritual beings. They have no flesh and bones. Psalm 104, 4. Who maketh his angels spirits? Hebrew word ruach, uh, spirit, wind, breath, all are uh, served. Those are all three English uh, words uh, here served by uh, the, the uh, ruach here, uh, the spirit, wind, breath. Um, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers, a flaming fire. So again, we have this idea of angels um, in fire or flame, and we see that uh, with uh, regard to Elijah and Elisha and other times, as we'll see later on. Uh, let's look at um, Acts, uh, well, let's look at Ephesians 6.12, back there, Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, and we have this list here. So uh, here the angels are separate, separate or described separately from flesh and blood. So um, no flesh and bones. Now underneath this, though, number two, we would say, 
that angels can utilize bodies, but were not created with them. Angels can utilize bodies, but were not created with them. Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 19. Fine line, again, between the physical world and the spiritual realm. And uh, Genesis 19 illustrates this in a very so a sobering way, I believe. And this is uh, the two angels were told in verse 1 that uh, come to Sodom and uh, go into the house of Lot. But Lot doesn't um, apparently... Um, is not shocked by their appearance. Uh, it doesn't make reference to the fact that they don't look like men. So, and there came two angels to Sodom and Eve, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground and said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night. Wash your feet. All right, so he assumed that these beings were going to be washing their feet. Well, if you wash your feet, then there's flesh and bones there not just spirit. Wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go in your ways. So uh, I don't know if that's kind of a rude uh, welcoming. You know, you get in late to somebody's house, they look at you and say, wash your feet, and they get up early and get out of here. <laughs> Maybe that would be a good comment to make to your roommate sometime. Hi, come in late, wash your feet, and get up early and get out of my face. And you would feel bad if your roommate says at the end of the verse, no, but I will abide in the hallway all night. I mean, in a second. <laughs> Adding the scripture right there. You're like, fine. Fine, stay there. Still wash your feet, though. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake them unleavened bread, and they did eat. All right, so do you see how this is transferring here? These are angels, yet they are... They're utilizing uh, bodies of, of men here. Uh, and so then, then it gets sorted from that point on uh, as uh, Sodom always does. Sodom and her followers, which we're getting a more regular dose of these days in America, are we not? Getting a big dose of Sodom. There, there, there we got it. There's some... Uh, Anyway, um, separate issue. <laughs> they can utilize bodies, but not created with them. Uh, thirdly, with regard to the nature of angels, letter C, they are a company. They are a company. Number one underneath that, not a race. Okay? We're a part of the human race. So... All of us are offspring, right? <clears throat> we, are, we were born. And uh, angels are a company. Number two, they're not able to reproduce. All right, so um, they're not able to uh, reproduce. So um, Hebrews 12.22, back to there, Hebrews 12.22. But you're coming to Mount Sion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company, company of uh, angels. So you look at the word company there. And then uh, Luke 20, 20, 34. Luke 20, 34. Jesus answered and said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. Letter D, 
under nature. Angels um, <clears throat> are shown to be at times smarter than man, but yet not omniscient. So smarter than man, um, smarter may not be the exact best word for that, maybe um, more informed, more knowledgeable uh, than man, but, but not omniscient. Let's look at some verses here. Psalm 103, 20. Psalm 103, 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. Right, right in the middle of a sentence here, it says, and to you who are troubled, rest. So uh, what this is referring to is there's going to be two things given back uh, to um, people on this earth by God. So number one, uh, in, in verses six and seven here, God is going to give back or pay back tribulation to people that trouble God's people. So God is going to, to people that trouble the people of the Lord, God is going to pay them back with tribulation. And then, verse 7, to God's people that are troubled or are being persecuted or are being um, uh, put, put into trials by people of this earth, God is going to give back rest. And so that's getting us into here, verse 7. So, and to you who are troubled, this is the second part of the, God's retribution. Uh, God is going to give rest. With us, and he's right here to the church of Thessalonica, a very young and a very persecuted church. He said, you're going to have rest. It's coming. Um, the word rest here was used for... a an army after it had marched, maybe a double march all day long with their packs and their armor through the heat. And when they got to their f location for that evening, that's the word rest here. That's, that's the word that's used in that context and in other literature. It's also the idea of a bow and arrow when the a bow is pulled all the way tight and it's under tremendous pressure and strain, right? It's its farthest point. And when that, uh, when that bow is released, and then the string goes back to its normal uh, position, that tension is released, uh, then that is the idea of rest here. So it's a great promise here. And this rest is with us. And when is this rest come? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven uh, with his mighty angels in flaming fire. All right, so this is quite a revelation here. The Lord and the angels, and again, the flaming fire is tied together with these angels. Uh, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Um, <clears throat> so in the meantime, men have hope and have an opportunity. And uh, when we see what the future is for those that have rejected the Lord, it should drive us in compassion to all we can right now. Um, but here we have these angels that uh, are uh, wise, but not omniscient. Um, sorry, you know what? I, I moved down to the... <sighs> Keep that one in mind. Okay, let's do this. Letter E. Letter E. 
They are stronger than man, but not omnipotent. I, my eyes went to the next, uh, my old man went to the next level. So uh, put 2 Thessalonians 1.7 under letter E. Okay, so erase, backspace, cut and paste, delete, remove, use white out. Letter E, angels are stronger than man, but not omnipotent. That is 2 Thessalonians 1.7. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to... So I want to give you a couple other verses, though, for letter D. Okay, so this is uh, this is the adjust. This is the fl being flexible today with your notes. Luke four thirty four. So this is under back under letter D. Luke four thirty four. Just some, just some other verses, some examples of smarter than man, but not omnipotent. Luke four thirty four. This is pretty uh, interesting here. Um, verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Cried with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. There's a lot in that verse. Wow, they knew where Jesus was uh, raised at. They recognized Jesus, this... Uh, this, uh, you know, spirit, this demonic spirit. He is in Capernaum in verse 31 here, and yet they knew that Jesus was, uh, was raised in the city of Nazareth. Uh, they knew about a future destruction that they faced. Art thou come to destroy us? So, um, we know, I know thee. Notice that... Uh, <clears throat> Notice that the pronouns switch back and forth between the us, the plural, the we, and the I, right? So, um, interesting as well there. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. <laughs> so, the demons know um, the, the person and the holiness and the... Even the attributes of the Lord, they know that. Um, 2 Samuel 14.20. Let's look back there. 2 Samuel So David, Joab, Absalom, through this uh, section. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or the left from aught that my lord the king has spoken for thy servant Joab. He bade me, and he put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid, to fetch about this form of speech hath thy servant Joab done this thing. And my lord is wise, according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. And the king said unto Joab, Behold, now I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. And uh, it goes on from there. Um, look at chapter 19, verse 27. Mephibosheth. And he answered, my Lord, O, uh, my Lord, O King, my servant deceived me, for thy servant said, I will saddle me and ask me, ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he has slandered thy servant unto my Lord the king, but my Lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. So the Old Testament uh, Persons here using the idea of angels as um, 
a higher state of knowledge than um, humans. Uh, letter E, we mentioned they're stronger than man, but not omnipotent. Um, let's look at 2 Peter 2.11 for that. 2 Peter 2.11. start to see uh, kind of a pervasiveness here, uh, permeating, I guess, a better word, of angels throughout all different parts of Scripture. And uh, so here we're in, in 2 Peter 2.11. Peter gives us a statement about the nature of angels here. <clears throat> 2 Peter 2.11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not really an accusation against them before the Lord... And, um, and they are these angels that are not, even though they are more powerful in, in uh, greater in power and might than, than humans, they are not speaking against God's authorities. So um, look at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, for punishment, chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous or daring are they, uh, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And uh, here, angels, which are greater in power and might, uh, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So, um, it goes back to these uh, presumptuous self-willed in verse 12. So, but with regard to the nature of angels, we see that they're greater in power and in might. Um, then F, let's look at this point. Angels here are immortal. Angels are immortal. Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Luke 20, 36. They are immortal. Verse 36, neither, this is again, can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels. And so there's never a funeral service for an angel. All right? They don't, they don't die. Uh, back at letter G here, Matthew 22, 30, let's note that they are genderless and unable to marry. They're genderless and unable to marry. Matthew 22, 30. For the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In heaven. Letter H, they are not omnipresent. Okay, they are not omnipresent. Uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Daniel 10, 12. Let's look there. So, and even we're, we might remember back to what Jesus said there as he was nearing the cross. He said, I could call uh, to God and he would send these legions of angels to me. And so, um, these angels are not omnipresent. Daniel uh, 10, 12 says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. So, in, so verse 14, now I am come. And so if he was omnipresent, he could have come... Um, despite this um, opposition that he faced. 
Uh, letter I, angels, as far as their nature, they are personal in the sense that they are not robots. Okay, they're, they're personal, they have personality. They're not robots. Um, and when we look at personality, uh, we uh, always look at um, intellect, emotions, and will. And it's obvious that angels have uh, free will because um, quite a few of them followed Satan uh, out, of, out of heaven. So angels uh, have intelligence. Uh, look back one chapter, Daniel 9.21. Angels have intelligence, Daniel 9, 21. And, uh, yea, whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And so there's some intelligence uh, represented there. Number two, they have emotions. Okay, they have emotions. Let's look at uh, Job 38.7. Job 38.7. So here the emotion of joy is expressed by the angels. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So there's great joy there expressed by the angels. Uh, you can write down Luke 2.13. Of course, there was great joy at the angels at creation in Job. And there was great joy of the angels in Luke chapter 2. At what important event? Uh, yes, the birth of Christ. So a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So um, creation and at the incarnation, Luke 2.13. 1 Peter 1.12, also with regard to angelic emotions. 1 Peter 1.12, let's see there. This is uh, angelic involvement with regard to inspiration so, and their emotions uh, about that. This is a, a desire. We have here the angels have a desire. And the desire of the angels was that they could uh, look into this inspiration of Scripture and the giving of Scripture. Now, they desired to do that. They were not a part of it. They desired it. Verse uh, Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. What do they desire to look into? Well, back up here in uh, verse 10, the salvation that the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So, the prophecies about the life of Christ uh, that the Old Testament gives. It's like the angels are interested in Christology, the doctrine of Christ. So uh, they have this emotion, this desire. Thirdly, they have a will. Angels have a will. Um, let's, look, uh, let's look first, we're almost there. Jude, verse 6. Jude, verse 6. Angels have a will. Um, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So these are the fallen angels. He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they left. In other words, that was their action. That was their will. They left. And Jude 6 will give us some other uh, important truths about angels. Isaiah 
also with this will. Isaiah 14, 2. Probably not two, but probably starting with, um, it's, it should be verse 12, but it, so that should be verse 12, but we'll start in verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, Lucifer, loose, light, F-E-R, fur is a... Uh, from Pharaoh, which means to bear, to carry. So Lucifer means a light bearer. Uh, loose Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and here are the five I wills, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, and I will be like the Most High. Uh, yet shalt thou be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And um, verse 19, thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Why? Because he's mimicking the true branch, right? Do you remember in the Old Testament when Jesus Christ in prophecy is called the branch? And so here Satan is a mimicker uh, of uh, the Lord in that sense. And, and uh but he's an, an abominable uh, branch or de detested uh, for his um, uh, mimicking Christ. Um, so the five I wills, the five I wills, this is satanic pride. And uh, keep your finger, oh no, keep your finger there. Let's look, side note, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, those that pride brought Satan down to um, down to hell, <laughs> cast out of heaven. It's pride. So this satanic pride is a warning, is used as a warning. And of all places, First Timothy chapter three verse six. Of all places that this graphic description of the destruction of pride of Satan in Isaiah 14 is brought back into the qualifications for a uh, pastor in uh, 1 Timothy 3.6. And uh, here, this last qualification, or this qualification is not a novice. A novice is uh, the idea of that a, is a new Christian or a, a new, um, a new, um, <laughs> A new, I don't want to say it strong here, a, a, new, a new believer. Uh, whether new in uh, times and salvation or new in the fact that he's not been trained uh, thoroughly. What's the problem with that? Uh, the problem is this, the potential for being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. In other words... The devil was condemned, condemned because of his pride. And we saw that in Isaiah 14, 12. And that's a serious passage. And so this, not a novice, um, comes into play here. And the warning is, do you remember what happened to, to the devil through his pride? Yes, we do. Well, uh, then uh, that's the temptation for a novice in the ministry, is that he gets pride, prideful and, and arrogant. And um, it takes time for us to put ourselves in the true state that we really are. All right, we need not to forget that. And uh, when someone gets a position, sometimes along with that comes pride and arrogancy. And that's a terrible place to be at because when the devil got in that place, he lifted himself up so much in the... The Lord hates pride, and he was, he was condemned. And so we have to be careful of pride, and the warning here uh, is, uh, is about that. 
All right, so that's some uh, various notes about the nature of angels that we see throughout Scripture. Uh, Roman numeral number five is the fall, the fall of angels. So we're going to look at um, uh, the fall of uh, angels. Of course, today there's, uh, there's Satan and there's his angels, his demons. Uh, and of course, there's the Lord and there's the ministering spirits. Uh, what about the fall of Satan? And uh, we see, we'll see this in uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, uh, 2 Peter, Jude, and Revelation. So we'll pick up there on Tuesday with regard to the, uh, to the fall of angels.